All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the panel Fair Streaming, hosted by Indies Austria, the Association of Independent Labels in my home country. As the speaker of the board of Indies AT, my name is Alexander Hirschenhauser. I say hello to my guests, who are Dr. Birte Wiemann. Hi there. Board member of VUT Germany, the German Indie Label Association, and digital manager at Cargo Records, based in Wuppertal, and she's joining us online from Wuppertal in Germany. Hello, Hi, Birte. Uh, good morning. Oh, no, it isn't even morning anymore. <laughs> Hi, everyone. On my side, physical in the room here in Vienna, Nermina Mumic, master of mathematics in the coming, or already, and doctor of mathematics in the coming, that's it. <laughs> Sorry for that confusion, because I was not so completely sure. However, uh, CEO and founder, founder of the startup uh, Legitary.com, based here in Vienna. And her startup is dedicated to improve data transparency of platform reportings. Last but not least, Anton Gurman, who is Global Director of Communications at Deezer Platform, based in London. He is joining online from London. Hi. Hello. Anton. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to not be there, but at least to participate. And just to give you a little info, Deezer has shown interest in a system change concerning distribution of streaming revenues. That's why have, we have invite, invited him. Thanks, Anton, for joining. Um, and we, of course, we have our online audience. A warm hello to everybody who is out there. And I'd like to invite you to please send in your questions or comments via the YouTube chat, not necessarily at the end of this panel, as soon as possible, because I'd like to be able to in, um, react on your questions and comments. So feel free. Our, nice assistance here in the room, we'll make sure I get all your chat comments. Let me give you a short intro in this topic, which is rather complex matter, and awareness out there is low, I think. The global turn of, a mu of music streaming industries in this year is expected to reach about 15 billion euros. To be distributed after platform deductions, approximately 10 billion euros. So it's a big thing, and it's fastly becoming the top income stream for artists and producers all over the world. The current situation about distributing these revenues is called pro rata system. It means all in one pot is divided by the total number of streams. There's one checkpoint after 30 seconds. Once you have heard 30 seconds of a song, it will count. Some users use have basic accounts and join for free. Some have student accounts which are uh, discounted. Premium accounts in Austria make 10 euros. Family accounts where up to six persons can uh, stream as they wish it will cost 15 euros per month. There are various proposals to improve these systems. One of these proposals is called user-centric. And it would mean that my 10 euros per month will be distributed to those rights holders of, this, of those songs, of exactly those songs that I have listened during the month. The other, another proposal is called multiple checkpoints. It means there should be checkpoints each 30 seconds, one minute, as various approaches possible. So the issues we're going to discuss here on this panel are fairness of distribution, as far as length of tracks is concerned, as far as the revenue per user stream is concerned, and we, I would like to discuss the, the issue of fraud and abuse of system. So let me give you a little thesis before I ha hand over to, to Birte. Be prepared, Birte. This is a little, a little spicy thesis now. I just say, everybody with focus on profit in making music, music 
will nowadays, under this existing system, only produce hip-hop tracks with 2 minutes 20 seconds, maximum 2 minutes 30. What do you think, Piatek? Well, actually, you're saying it's really spicy and provocative. It's not provocative at all. It's just the reality we currently live with in the system that we work with. But, um, because that's something that I really like to tie in um, with what you said about the prorata model, because I'm not sure that everyone who's actually, you know, who's having a, a subscription who actually streams music knows exactly how this prorata model works. And I, I funnily enough, because you said you're going to have this um, provocative thesis at the beginning of our talk about five minutes ago before we got into this talk. And funnily enough, I wanted to start with the provocative um, thesis that um, people might not even be aware of, that um, if I listen to a leftist punk band for all my subscription time, all the time, all month, the music, uh, the, the revenue might still go to the, to the misogynist hip hop artist or whatever it means, because it, that's, that's my provocative thesis as well. And that's, that's something that people might not be aware of in the provider model. And that's why we're here today, because we wanted to discuss how this revenue can be distrib distributed on a much fairer basis. But going back to this, what you said, um, if hip hop was the thing that everyone would focus on, which is certainly the case, then we as cargo records in Germany would certainly be done because we have lots and lots of indie artists, guitar based artists and so on and so forth. And those artists still want to make a li living and I'm not sure they're going to switch to hip hop tomorrow. So yeah, not that provocative. Sorry, Alexander. <laughs> No problem at all. That's why we discuss, because there must be different points of view, otherwise it's going to be boring. I mean, what do you, do you think? First of all, thank you for having me here at the Waves Festival. Um, I mean, as you stressed at the beginning, we know that the streaming market is one of the rapidly growing markets, growing with uh, growth rates of 20 to 30 percent. And what we have to be aware of is that COVID-19 uh, even pushed that growth. I think there is a study of Nielsen which predicts additional growth of 12 percent. So we have a huge market. And of course, if you are facing the situation that you have that big market, you want any contributor of the market to get a fair share of the revenues and the market to be distributed in a fair way. And I mean, today we're going to discuss how this fair distribution could look like, but what we stress with Legitary is the following point. It's not only about distributing the existing pie, we have to be aware of the actual size of the pie. And that's also something that we don't know. So it's about uh, figuring out whether the streaming figures that are being reported are correct or not. So what we found out with Legitary in the past scope of the year where we worked with uh, major labels, indies, we worked with auditing companies, is what we realized that there is an average underpayment of 7%, which means that projected on the whole market size, it's $850 million that are not being paid correctly. So I think in this whole discussion around how the revenues should be distributed in a fair way, I think one discussion point is, of course, what payment model you should take. And I think another discussion point, which is very crucial, is are the figures that are being reported, are they correct? They should be verified. And this is actually something that we tackle with Legitary, that we validate the streaming figures that are reported from the DSPs to the labels, from the labels to the artists, is that we verify these figures and figure out is there an underreporting or an overreporting? Okay, so from your point of view, data analysis, uh, you will not make any point about whether certain genres or styles are better off or not. This is not something that you watch, you watch simply the transparency of data. Our point is providing a transparency tool because what we are facing is we have billions of streams occurring every day. And so we see that on the one hand side, the music was digitalized with streaming, which caused a huge upwind for the whole music industry and led to a revival of the music industry. But on the other hand side, we currently don't have the technical tools to provide transparency to the data. And I think their data analysis, uh, data science is a crucial point, which provides with the current level of technology tools to give the music right holder the transparency he or she requires 
to get insights about the revenue streams, to understand the revenue streams better and to know, okay, am I being underpaid or is there an abnormal movement that shouldn't be there? And I think that's a transparency that all players in the market will benefit from in a huge way. I'd really, really like to hear more okay. about that as we speak. And that sounds really interesting because I'm intrigued to hear how it's done. But um, I guess let's hear Anton first. Um, I guess that's where Anton comes in because he probably has the whole picture as because you are run, you're running a platform, you must have all data. I think Anton. Um, there, obviously, there are obviously a number of things to address here. Um, let's start with the one that from our perspective is probably more straightforward. We provide full data to the rights holders. Um, every kind of on, a, on an ongoing basis. So from, from our perspective, you know, obviously it's in our it's in our interest that the reporting is correct. As far as we understand reality, the reporting uh, should be correct. And that's an ongoing dialogue between our label team and the various rights holders. Moving then on to, uh, you know, the, the kind of the, the topic of the panel and fair streaming, I think yeah, in the, we've, all, we've, all, we've, I, we've actually touched upon this already. In the current system, you can listen to an artist, uh, you know, all your listening time, whatever it is, uh, but all of your money will go to, to the biggest artist uh, on the platform. And of course, from our perspective, it doesn't take a lot of kind of, I mean, we've done a lot of analysis, but it doesn't kind of take a lot of, of thinking to understand that that's really, really strange. And, and audio streaming, or especially music streaming today, is the only industry probably where you can, you know, where you can consume content and, and the, the, the creator of that content, or rather the rights holder, because we obviously don't interface with artists directly, uh, actually do not get paid for that. Um, to kind of to end this introduction from my end with an anecdote, we did a tool last year at Deezer where we allowed all of our users to see what percentage of their monthly subscription royalties went to artists they had listened to. Um, from the people I knew, uh, it was anything from five to 10% was very typical. And this is from people who, you know, people who have quite niche tastes, it could be five, people who have a fairly mainstream taste, it could still be as, as, as much as 80% of the royalties they contribute through, through their subscription doesn't actually go to any of the artists they've listened to, which is just bizarre. Um, and we can get into the data and we will, we have the data, we can get into uh, why that happens, but at the core of it, you know, a, a, a small percentage of very active, genuine users, we're not talking about fraud, that's a different conversation, decide who gets paid. And that's the same case on any platform. Um, we we're totally artist agnostic uh, and genre agnostic. We don't have any view on what our, our subscribers should listen to. And therefore it's it's pretty simple to kind of to see that that people should be paid fairly for 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 the consumption. Um, let's get probably a bit a little bit deeper into that. Uh, issue of the length of the tracks. The situation, as I described, 2 minutes 30 will be the same income like 20 minutes epic work. It, only the, 30, the first 30 second count. Uh, what do you guys think? Who is, is anybody having a, a point of view there? Is there a need to improve things or are we happy? with it as it is? Well, it is definitely a point that that's something that you just suggested was to have the different checkpoints during the track, but it doesn't even have to be the, I don't know, 20 minute classical piece that you, you would have to listen to, but just, just look at Bohemian Rhapsody or something like that. That's a really long song and it's not gonna be counted as a whole because after the 30 seconds you're done. At the for the time being, and that's where the whole thing comes in with user centric that we're going to go into. I only have if it works this way, I only have a certain amount of revenue that I can give. And if I want to listen to whatever it is, 
my money goes to that exactly uh, exact artist. So my money goes to Queen and it doesn't go to the whatever hip hop artist it might be. So that is definitely a start because the whole fraud thing that's been dis discussed every now and then and it has popped up every now and then again will most probably not happen with user-centric, but then Nomina might know more about how the user-centric system might be used to manipulate screening as well. But from, from the point of view that I'm at at the moment is that user-centric is more liable, uh, less liable to manipulating than the current system, the prorator system. It's a little switch in topic now, but, but yes, let's do it. Let's talk about um, abuse. Why not? We come back to, to the length of text later. Uh, what about user-centric? Would that help uh, to prevent abuse? Anton or Nermina, who has... Um, I can comment on that as a starting point. There are certain kinds of abuse that disappear in a user-centric model basically overnight. So any kind of... Uh, any kind of fraud where you set up a network of account, whether it's a bot network or hijacked account, it doesn't really matter. The, the fact that you can't, uh, oh, you know, you can't create any weighting in the market share means that you cannot get more money out of the system than you effectively put into the accounts. So, so, and, and then that is one of the, you know, one of the big benefits of a user-centric approach that you know, it makes, you know, certain kinds of fraud and certain kinds of financial fraud, which obviously damage the whole industry and viable, uh, which is a huge upside. I think, does it take away all kinds of stream manipulation? The answer is probably no. Uh, and then there are, all, you know, there are other scenarios that, that you know, not all manipulation is, is, is only about money, for example, like, you know, we have periodically in, in, in all countries, you have artists who will go and ask their fans to stream them on repeat, uh, to suddenly go through the charts um, and abuse the system in various ways. So again, I think it's important to understand that user-centric is not a, it's not a magical bullet that solves all the issues we're facing as an industry today. It solves the issue of fairness. It doesn't take away the need uh, to having, you know, having and keeping uh, fraud detection tools, for example which is something that we, and I'm sure the others, have invested a lot in, uh, and, and monitoring the streams to make sure that bad will players get, uh, get apprehended and, and that doesn't influence the reporting and the numbers. So, so yeah, I mean, not all fraud goes away, but, but certain kinds of fraud, in particular the one where you can get more money out from streaming, uh, disappears. Just touching back on the earlier topic, and, and I don't want to take up too much time, but when it comes to fraud, then other and length of tracks, we come back to that. Okay, Anton. Fine. We come back to now the length of tracks. It. Let's let's make put this one after the other. Uh, now, I mean, now we, we've learned there's two various ways of, of abuse. There's you can uh, use the system to get out more than you put in, so it's a financial abuse, and you can uh, abuse it by getting more audience, more relevance by increasing the popularity of, of, of playlists and stuff like that. What are we talking about? Are we talking about uh, peanuts, or is this something? Are these relevant amounts to be focused on? What is your data analysis, uh, analysis saying? I think Anton and Birte made some uh, very interesting points and very important points that both um, both distribution systems do have their shortcomings. Of course, in the ProRata system, one of the big shortcomings was that it kind of encouraged these fake plays, bots and everything. But also the other system also, of course, has its shortcomings, uh, which also have to be tackled. But as I mentioned earlier, that no matter what system you then decide on, I think in both systems, you have you still need to know how big kind of the cake is that should be distributed. So, and this is what we tackle with Legitary that we validate how often was an artist stream because even if you have the user-centric model, then even with my subscription, I have to know accurately how often did I stream artist A or artist B and which share of my personal subscription then should go to artist A or B. And, I, and what we do see is that these figures that are being reported are distorted. And I don't say that they are distorted intentionally, but because also the digital service provider have an interest to report accurate figures and there is a huge importance on that and a huge awareness of that. But what we saw when working with our clients is 
that these anomalies that occur in reporting can be due to many, many issues. I mean, you have to be aware of, we have billions of dreams arising every day, and that these companies are mostly music companies and not tech companies, and they also have their issues when dealing with the data. So what we saw is that there are many issues when importing the data, technical issues, bugs in codes, and this is also something that we can tackle with our algorithm, and what we saw, as I mentioned earlier, is on average 7% underpayment, but what we also saw with the current model is that there is also a huge over-indexing where you see that one platform is significantly outperforming the other platforms for a specific artist, what could be also indicative of fake plays. And what we saw there was on average 2%, where we see that comparing these figures, that underpayment is still a bigger issue than this over-indexing. Thank you, it's really data, politics of data we talk here. Huh? Um, Okay, so any conclusion on this, on this question? What helps against abuse and fraud? What helps best? Before we, we, before we leave this question, I'd like to have one final little short final sentence from all three of you. I think as, as disappointing as that might sound, I don't think we can find a waterproof system. It would be super desirable to have that, to have that waterproof system. But as long as we're playing around, so to speak, sorry, didn't mean that disparagingly, but as long as we just look at data, there will be ways of um, manipulating that data, I think. In a nutshell. Um, yeah, I think, I think that, you know, Verte, that's, that's, that's the main point, right? You know, when you have very big data sets and uh, lots of complexity, there will always be an evolution. And in some ways, when you have bad faith players, it's also an arms race where we improve the tools and then we continuously evolve the reporting and then optimize it to make sure that the errors decrease. I, you know, I don't think we have any particular wisdom on that. It's an ongoing dialogue that has to happen between all the players in the industry. In terms of, you know, I think, I think in terms of motivation, life is easier on our side. Our, you know, our best case that makes our life as easy as possible is to report data perfectly so that there's, there's no hassle. And we, we, you know, we like life to be simple, to focus on, on, you know, on usage and, and improving the platform and the content. So from that perspective, I think it's, you know, our teams work already very closely with rights holders on reporting and then, then as part of the dialogue, we continue to improve, you know, all parts of the system, whether it's the back end or the front end, or the reporting end, and that is going to continue to happen. Was much more than another chill. Thank you. Nermina. Yeah, to make a long answer short, uh, use legendary. That's the reason why we founded our company is providing transparency to these huge data amounts for the music right holders. And this is the point where we see us and where we also in the long run want to establish a kind of an auditing or reporting standard where all the rights holders have the technical tools to gain transparency and full control over the data. Thanks. Let me say something. I'm very proud of having you and Legitary based here in Vienna, because I feel this is something essential and crucial to the industry in the future. Uh, let's go back to the length of tracks. What should we do? What can we do? And what is the impact of the system we have at the moment? Birte just mentioned Queen's Rhapsody. I mean, we have many other rather long songs in, in various genres, jazz, world music, anything that is more improvised. Are these songs, it's, it's, more, it's more expensive to produce a 10 minute track than uh, to do a two minutes 20 track. Would these be ready to implement more checkpoints? I think that's a question that, that it's an ongoing conversation, again, with the rights holders. I don't have a good answer, the truth is, for you, for you guys today. I think it's not only a case of long tracks. 
so so you have of course a lot of music where it's not only about the length it's also where you wonder would something like i don't know let's take an example would something like hey by the pixies be as successful today which is a you know music that requires you to play it a bunch of times before you get it because it, it it there's a long lead in so so the the I think there are, there are two parts to the length discussion. One is that, you know, tracks are getting shorter and that's driven by the fact that you have to grab attention quicker. So you have shorter, you know, so the way that production happens is different. Fundamentally, you get to the hook quicker, you have to catch the tension and you see that in, 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 in most of new music. The second part is some, you know, some artists and producers will, you know, have already, of course, understood that shorter tracks mean overall more plays. And then and, and, and they get that. But in the end, I mean, it's not really up for me to answer what, what the users would, would do, because it's not only, you know, yes, you may have a checkpoint every 30 seconds, but if you have a two minute track, so you have four checkpoints. But it's, it's so my point is, it's not only the length of the track, it's also user behavior. And user behavior we see today, especially with younger users, is that they skip more. They're not prepared to listen as long, which means that you know you may have you may have checkpoints uh, that uh, you know that's it every thirty seconds. But at the end of the day, you know if a song has eight checkpoints but people skip after two after two minutes, you will still get exactly the same number of uh, you know of checkpoints as you have in, in in a two minute track. So it doesn't necessarily again you, you know there's no one solution that magically cures all the issues. Um, there's you know we haven't really kind of shared any external kind of work on that area so i think that's all that we can say today the other thing though before is that it's not only about tracks it's also about the fact that a lot of the you know the, the shortness of the tracks obviously yield itself to different kind of manipulations so if you go on any of the platforms today you will you know and, and look for like rain sounds you'll find these albums that have literally like 40 second tracks of rain instead of one continuous one which which is an issue and uh, again, the answer here is 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 uh, is, is dialogue and, and tools to detect whether this is being abused. I think more than than anything else. Does that again? Does that solve everything? No. You have classical music where you have tracks which are twenty minutes, and you have four tracks in an album. And then yes, I think you know over time there has to be evolution in the industry that that makes sure that these that these content creators and these right holders also get get treated fairly, which patently they're not today. Uh, and I think that, you know, that, that, that's pretty obvious to everyone. So why don't we start? Because that's something that, you know, I was looking into that. I was doing a bit of research on, on other models that might be there. And um, these are, I think, I don't know, when did you announce you might want to go user-centric 2019, end of 18? I don't quite remember anymore. And I was like, yeah, they're doing something. Something's changing, you know? And I know I spoke to a lot of people um, outside of the music industry who really said they might want to get a Deezer a subscription because they thought it was going to be a lot fairer than any other model right now. The question is, why does every platform stick to the status quo? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. And unfortunately, it's not a very complicated one. So from our perspective, we're ready. We've done all the back, all the all the the, the legwork on this. Uh, we can switch the data reporting very quickly, and uh, we're basically ready to go. I don't know exactly how long it would take us to switch if if that you know if we were doing a pilot, but I'm guessing it's like I don't know a few a week, a few weeks. So it's not a significant time investment. The truth is that in order to switch, we have to get all of the rights holders. So all of the labels on board there can't be you know there 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 can't be two measuring systems on the platform because effectively you end up with a market share that is over 100% so you can't actually pay people properly so so it's a you know it's 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 a long the truth is that it's a long and complex conversation the the we actually started talking about user centric in in 2017 where the early days it's not been a very short discussion this um we shared uh, you know we we started you know campaigning more probably more aggressively last year uh we shared a you know a bunch of data that we ran on the analysis 
but getting all the labels on board takes time. And again, you know, our position is very simple. We'd love to do it. We're ready for a pilot at any point uh, in any country. It's just that you have to do it. You know, all of the rights holders on the platform in that country has to be on board. And when I say has to be on board, it's yes, if you know, if there are some smaller rights holders who are not on board, you could consider a pilot where you actually take that content down from the platform temporarily and then you run a pilot and analyze it, etc. But these are also conversations with the majors, of course, who have to be on board. And uh, yeah, we are where we are. Um, I don't think the conversations are closed. They're not necessarily negative, but as with any organization, there will be many different views that need to be taken into account and it takes time to align this. Now, there's probably lots of reasons. In a very important, you brought in a very important point that rights owners need to agree because it means changing contracts. So we need the agreement from the three majors and basically from Merlin for the Indies. I can't see that agreement on the horizon so easily. So we will discuss a few more times, I guess. <laughs> and Namina, I'd, I'd like to know from you, have you ever did any analysis, did you any, any, ever do any analysis on uh, the, what would happen if the length of tracks would happen or would matter for distribution? What, what would that would that change anything in in in, in the distribution? And the second thing in one go, you know, we don't only have music, we have audiobooks, we have podcasts, and I am watching a rising discussion, controversial discussion, about how much is going to audiobooks and. Is that too much? Because it rather should go to music producers and artists. Audiobooks have tracks in the background, every chapter. So if you listen to an audiobook, you might have listened to 200 tracks. Have you, did you do any analysis on, on, on these topics? I think that's a great and very important question on how you measure a stream and what do you count as stream. And I think that's not legitary's discussion because once the industry agrees on how they measure a stream, if they measure it after 30 seconds a minute, if they uh, include checkpoints or if they take the length of the stream as a measure, once the industry agrees on that, then we take this measure and put it into our system. So for legitary, it doesn't matter on how you measure the stream, but I think nevertheless it's a very important discussion that has to be, uh, that has to be done. Um, but what we know also from our experience, I mean, legendary is not only applicable to music streaming, it's also applicable to uh, video streaming and gaming as well, because there in the streaming you have a quite, you have the analog data structure. You have the content piece and it's streamed on different platforms. And that's kind of the structure we require for our algorithm. And we also talked to people from the gaming industry and um, their kind of the measure, what they take or consider for taking is the length, how long a game was streamed. So there are different models out on the market, but nevertheless, whether we take the length of the stream as a measure or if I streamed a song 30 seconds or a minute or longer, it doesn't matter for us. No statistic data so far for uh, how many tracks are very short, how many tracks are very long, what would change? You have not really done any calculations on that yet. That wasn't actually the scope of our business. What we do is we receive the revenue reports from the different platforms and validate whether the figures that are being reported from the platforms to the label are correct or not. So, but I think that's a very interesting point that should be explored further. Please, I invite you to do so. <laughs> it would be great things to, to learn. Uh, Birte, do you have in your repertoire at Cargo Records also audiobooks? Are you representing any podcast uh, publishers? Um, to be absolutely honest, that, that was what was kind of wrong in your introduction. I'm firmly rooted in the physical business. I'm just doing the digital platform for B2C and D2C fulfillment. So I'm not the digital manager. But as far as I know, we don't really focus on audiobooks or um, sort of uh, all other kind of streams apart from music streaming. But that's a question that I want to give back. Like, if there's music, in an audiobook, 
it surely is licensed, right? So um, um, that's something that I want to give back as a question and, and another remark as well. Isn't it, um, isn't it not the question to think about the length of tracks? Isn't it the question to think of um, fair remuneration? So, you know, we're talking about the length of tracks, but we have to still find a system for all kinds of tracks. If it is a 20 minute indie track or a two minute hip hop track, it doesn't matter. We need to find a way to find a, an even distribution of revenue. And if the point is, uh, this must reflect the length or must reflect what's, what's that, the parameters that's, you that's, would like that's to... That's basically to... my question. We, we still have to find a way and I'm not quite sure that length is going to be the exact metric that we can use. To be honest, my humble view, uh, the only really rational thing is length. Anything else would be tasty. But isn't, isn't that where the you know? user-centric system would work? Because I only have the limited, the limited um, bit of revenue that I can give out. So if I listen to more longer tracks, the artist is still going to get the bit of revenue from my subscription. If I listen to more shorter tracks, it's going to be less revenue for each artist. So I think that might already be a solution. But as we said already, and as Anton said as well, user centric cannot be the end of all wisdom. But it's something that we should start to see whether it works and how it works, because I know there are millions of other systems and models that are being looked into, but none of them have really been you know, realized and no one has really started working with those models. Anton, how, how is the sectors of audiobooks and podcasts developing at Deezer uh, in compar compared to music? Many people tell me it's a rising market. It's, it's growing, getting more and more pieces of the cake. Yeah, I mean, yes. I mean, the simple answer is so where we, you know, in the markets where we have audiobooks, uh, which primarily is Germany, but uh, we've launched recently in the Netherlands, we, you know, we, we're seeing growth, uh, podcasts, not only on Deezer, but I think that's a globally pretty well known that podcasts everywhere are booming. Uh, the lockdowns have, you know, driven podcast consumption even further, not only on Deezer, but, but definitely on our platform. So, so I think it's, I think it's important to, to kind of also remind ourselves that the way that the contracts are structured and the way that people contribute content is very different for podcasts than it is for music. So the complexity, you know, the complexity of the music industry is, is probably slightly less than the complexity of the podcast industry, even though technically you have some different aspects. Again, I don't think that's, you know, m maybe switching direction and we can, you know, and please tell me to stop otherwise, but coming back to the user centric approach and the length, I think, you know, like Virta says, there are a lot of things that, that, that one can look at to continue to improve, you know, the, the, the music industry and especially, you know, streaming. But if you ask people today, I mean, normally, you know, people, listeners, music fans, they do not understand that things are not user centric. I promise you that. And then it's, you know, it's just, just ask anyone, but more importantly, if you ask artists today, they do not understand that the music that is consumed is not you know, that, that they're not paid for the consumption. They're paid on the market share of the overall platform. If you ask managers, it's the same. And this is what we've encountered in this conversation. It's, you know, for, for whatever, you know, we're not going to go into the legacy reasons that we have, uh, you know, kind of market share driven payments. But at the very core of it, you know, we all pay the same amount roughly for our music streaming subscription per month. And, uh, Given that we pay for other services as well, it's 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 just it defies logic to most people that that the money that you pay doesn't go to the to the content you, you know to the content you consume. When it comes to video streaming, obviously the landscape is is, is very very different because you have windowing and you have everything else that makes it fundamentally not comparable to music. But my point is, until you fix user centric, you can't you know everything else becomes moot. And uh, again, you know, and this is a question that, for example, I've gotten 
talking about user centric before. So, you know, I've gotten two kinds of questions kind of challenging the concept, which I think is a good thing. And one is, you know, if I if I only stream 10 songs a month, you know, is my contribution as important as someone who streams, you know, a thousand songs a month? And the answer shortly is, is yes, because the unit here is not number of streams or consumption. The unit is that we pay the same amount of money and the distribution of that money should go to the artists we consume. That's the first thing. The second argument that people, you know, sometimes flag against the user centric approach is, you know, should, you know, but what if I only listen to Drake? Then should all my money go to Drake? And the answer is very simply, yes. If you only listen to Drake, all your money should go to Drake because it's your choice in the end. And, uh, you know, we're not looking to, user centric is about a proper, I'm not even gonna call it fair, it's the right this way to distribute money based on consumption. If you're buying Nike trainers, your money does not go to Adidas or all it's the other way around. If you're buying, if you're buying Cox Sporty trainers, your money doesn't go to Nike, maybe is a better metaphor for this. And it really shouldn't because you're also, you know, you're also supporting the acts that, uh, you know, in the music, you're supporting the artists that, that, you, that you enjoy. And it's not really our place as a platform, and I would argue our place as an industry to kind of to dictate what people should listen to. Obviously, there's also marketing going on and initiatives and artists conveying, you know, conversing with their fans, which is how it should be. Now, user-centric doesn't change the fact that as an artist, it's tough. It's going to continue to be tough. If you're starting out, and this is again another argument against user-centric that we've heard, you know, if you have no fans, user centric will be, you know, very rough. Or if you only have 10 fans, the truth is, I mean, it's not exactly a golden kind of a golden feel out there right now. And the fact is you should still be connected to your fans more directly. The long-term benefits of user centric also benefits artists, of course, because if you're at your peak today and you're over indexing on the platform, that's great. But what happens when it's not your turn anymore and someone else says that you're becoming legacy? because a lot of the artists actually age together with their fans. I mean, we've done studies on this on Deezer and people stop discovering new music on average when they're 27 or 28 or whatever it was. Um, and then does that mean that, that the artists that I listened to when I was 20, you know, that, that they shouldn't be paid anymore? Because I continue to listen to them a fair amount. So, so that connection between fan and artist is strengthened on the user centric. On the flip side of it, it doesn't change the amount of money in the system. And I think that's important to emphasize. This is not a magic bullet. It doesn't suddenly mean that there's, there's more, that the market doubles or anything else. I mean, in very, very simple terms, we pay 70% of our revenues, of our actual top line revenues directly to rights holders. And then the, re the remaining 30 we use to, to build our platform, to pay salaries, to market, et cetera. So user-centric approach doesn't actually change that dynamic. The same amount of money in the system just gets allocated differently. It's just that there is a, a reallocation. I think one thing that still should be stressed also within the user-centric model, I mean, to be very concrete and to stick to the example, even if I take the user-centric approach, it matters how often I stream a song. So, for example, if I stream 10 times Drake and 10 times Beyonce, 50% are going to Drake, 50% Beyonce, but I still rely on the accurate reporting of the streams because it does make a difference if I streamed 20 times Drake and only 10 times Beyonce, then two thirds of my subscription should have gone to Drake. So even in the user-centric approach, it still matters if the figures are being reported correctly. So basically it would help. A change of system would help. And I guess it also would help those people who I watch discussing more and more intensely about the issue whether or the question whether more money is going towards audiobooks than and taking away from music than it should. Because if I'm a user who is into audiobooks and I don't listen much music, that's why I pay and I pay for audiobooks and should go to should go there. If I, I'm not interested in audiobooks, I'm paying for music and it should go to music. So I guess we all agree on this, right? We have, by the way, we have a question from an online guest. Hey. I'm not sure about that question. And once again, I would like to repeat my invitation to everybody out there by virtual presence. 
or here in the room. If you have any questions, comments, if you want to join in the discussions, please do so. If you're out there on the YouTube stream, you can use the YouTube chat. And via that chat, uh, one question has re reached us. There is, there is also the ARPU to paying members from Philip. Philip, I'm not really sure what you mean by ARPU, but I now I guess ARPU. Could it mean average revenue per user? That's what I would translate. And it would be on my list of issues anyway. And I'm more than welcome to switch to that topic. And Philip, I hope it's the topic that you were wanted, wanted to refer us to. So it, average revenue per user. Not all users are providing the same revenue. Some are paying more, some are paying less. Uh, is there any, other, to, to start with the facts, do you anything about how many users are using which kind of, 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 of subscription level? We have the free, freemium, we have the uh, student's tariff, we have the full uh, standard tariff, and we have a family account possibility. Do you have any data about how many users are using which tariffs, or is that something we need to ask Anton? I think that's something that needs to be asked the DSPs because they have the total pie of their subscriptions, and I think that's a question they can answer best. Are you ready to give us the, the, the ratio of uh, account levels? If not, then just do it in average or in approximation. No, I'm really sorry, but that's not something that, that uh, you know, is for me to give out. That information, again, is reported to the rights holders in the, in the recurring reporting. We don't, unfortunately, make it available publicly. But I think, I, think I do. Re oh, sorry, Anton. To go no, no, go on, go on. No, I, I was just. Um, I think the average um, example that you always take is that Spotify has something like two hundred and ninety million users and only one hundred and thirty million subscribers. So I think that already gives us a fair idea of how revenue is distributed as a whole. It's just you know it's just one DSP and it's just one number, but I think it gives you a good idea. And then if you take into account that there's platforms like YouTube, dot, 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 everyone knows that that's a bit problematic. Um, we know that in an ideal world, everyone would pay a subscription, but not everyone does. But I think... Again, not everybody's paying the same subscription. In an ideal world. A family yeah. account. Yeah, but, but I think... Uh, could yeah. make up, up to six persons and they pay 15 euros a month. But it's not, it's not that... So they stream six times as many tracks in average, maybe? Do um, they? Look, I don't have, unfortunately, any stats to share. I think it's, it's as usual, it's not necessarily that straightforward. Yes, a family, you know, family account will have more users on average. I mean, that's pretty self-evident. But you also have to look at lifetime value and things like that, right? So we're not only looking at, you know, how much you pay per month. We're also looking at the fact that the family account doesn't, you know, it's much mature and resilient, which benefits everyone, of course, in the industry. Because they do not, once you're, you're locked in with the family, you're not going to move back to the free tier, for example. Or in, and so, so, so again, you know, I can't unfortunately give out any stats in terms of, of, uh, the distribution or, or or the revenues, but the the optim you know the the evolution of how the accounts are set up and then what the payment system looks like is also a dialogue with the rights holders because of course it's not something that we just implement unilaterally and then we kind of go here now you have to live with this this is a, a these are long conversations and long contracts that are all very granular in terms of uh, you know in terms of how things work uh, I'm sure over time the industry will evolve in terms of payments because if you just taking a very simple example i mean audio streaming basically has let's take it for simplicity four different tiers you have the free tier the premium you have a family tier and then for some services like us you have also hi-fi uh, which targets a, a more discerning and, and demanding audience and that's kind of the same everywhere there's no other options if you look at video uh, or, or uh, 
you know, or or or, or pay TV, etc. You know, the the operators have managed to to have much more granular payment models. If you look at someone like Sky, you have you the option to take everything, or you have the option to to do kind of packages, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, I mean, clearly there's there's going to continue to be innovation over time in how you know how and for what these the, the packages make you know how, how the packages are, are constructed but again i mean this is something that is you know it is driven in dialogue with the rights holders it's not something that 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 the sps just kind of wake up and then implement thank you um a quick check on the Watch tells me that we are slowly coming to the end of this panel. We have 10 more minutes to go. And I have a question from a guest here in the room. Do we have a public mic? Yes, we do. If... Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I have a question. Maybe some other artists ran into the similar problems, or maybe they will. Hopefully, it can help also other people. But uh, regarding live streams and the legal parts of it, so uh, I did a live stream for two of the projects I have. So it was one big live stream divided in two, and uh, we kind of hope for uh, you know good revenue, but it didn't happen. And then we ran into legal problems with the, the, the organizer uh, and with the rights because um, he basically wanted to sell it later to TV and telling us that, you know, we don't get anything because we didn't earn almost anything during the live stream. And I, we gave away a free show, basically, which normally would cost a couple thousand dollars. Uh, so we were not fine with it. And his reaction was that he will just put it down from, from online streaming and it won't exist anymore. And uh, I thought that was not like a fair type of communication. And that, uh, you know, uh, I was just wondering what can I do better uh, next time so I don't run into the situation if there is any way that I can also have that, you know, uh, material so it doesn't disappear whenever the organizer decides to be pissed off or whatever, you know. And also what would be a good, let's say, future future term uh, of uh, of like uh, revenue or agreement in case they decide to sell it somewhere else. You know, they have a great material now which they can sell. They plan on like a special channel with Czech musicians featured there during the, what they have recorded during the live stream. So uh, I was also wondering what would be like a good percentage or agreement for the future, you know, pitch of that anywhere else. Thank you. This is a very important and a very interesting question. Well, it's a completely different topic, but we might be able to quickly look into it, but really quickly, because it's a completely different topic. It's about monetization of live streaming. Deezer is out of the picture. Deezer is uh, not uh, doing any live streaming. Monetization. Cargo is not your core business, I guess. Nermina, did you uh, ever watch live streaming and the monetization possibilities of that? It's also something we don't deal with, I think. But it's a great example that when we're talking of live streaming, that one also sh should put a spotlight on the whole right side and that this should also be tackled. Yes. Okay, so that's something that thank you for your question. Sorry. But I'm afraid this is the wrong panel for it. I'll keep it in mind, and maybe next year we'll have a panel on monetarization of live streaming. I did write an uh, article about that, by the way, for on the, watch uh, the website of Indies AT. You find an, you find a, a statement about these things. Um, yeah, Philip is coming back online saying audiobooks are consumed by premium subscribers mainly, so that. Uh, means more money for the platforms. And hip hop, for example, is uh, consumed mainly by freemium users. That might be right and well, probably is right. Philip, many thanks for your comment and your input. I'd like to come to the final round here for you guys. And I invite you to give us your final statements on, on our issue, on our topic, fair streaming, question mark. Imagine you are the foundation, the master of the world, 
and you have a chance to change everything. How would you change distribution and measuring of streaming revenues? Nermina, you first. I think it's a very important question that needs to be done, how to distribute the revenues in a fair way, and I think that's the interest of all the right holders and of all the players of the industry, but nevertheless, which system at the end of the day you agree on, every single system relies on accurate data and accurate reporting, and for this reason, accurate reporting is the basis of every single system, and this is what we tackle with Legitary and try to make a contribution to provide more fair and, uh, transparency and also fairness to the industry. Birte, you are master of the universe. Um, what would yeah. you change? <clears throat> um, I heard an, a very interesting um, simile the other day, or a metaphor, or whatever you want to call it. And a friend of mine said that um, as far as um, mobility in the world is concerned, we're now focusing on, on electricity and hybrid cars and whatever. But we also know this is just one step in the evolution of changing everything about mobility. And I think we can sort of take this over into the streaming business. We have to start somewhere and make this evolution start to see where, where we can end. And I know, and I can, you know, we could go on for another hour that the user centric model is probably not the final solution, but we need to make steps to get somewhere. And we, we don't know yet where this is going to go. So I don't know whether, you know, if I could change it right now, I wouldn't have the solution either. Sounds wise. Thanks, Birte. Anton, you now have our last two minutes, I'm afraid, and I'd kindly ask you to uh, include an answer to a question that has just reached me from an online user, Musa Furtak has asked. Uh, does these uh, have any mix tracks or mix sets on, in your system, and how do you revenue these mix sets? Um, okay. Challenging because they, they consist of many, many different tracks and, and you must detect those first. However, this is maybe you can quickly include that in your final two minutes and once again, you too, you are the master of universe and you can change everything. What would you change? Okay, let's start with the tracks. Uh, we do have mixtapes on Deezer uh, which are created just for us and uh, very simply we make sure that all of the not only the DJ, but also the, the, the artists who have made the tracks are remunerated properly. Uh, how we do that today is, uh, unfortunately, I can't really go into that deeper, but that's one of the things that we have focused on very much, is to actually remunerate the people in the mixes, um, and also to highlight what the songs in the mixes are in the playlist, et cetera, et cetera. Now, to the big question, um, I think a paradigm change is always painful, right? The complexity increases the longer a system has been in place. And as we saw when streaming music was becoming a thing, there are a lot of people who, who are just comfortable. And I think that's, you know, if nothing else, this, that's the human nature. You get comfortable with the current system and uh, you don't really want to change things because they're working well enough. The truth is they're not actually working that well. And, and change in the long term benefits everyone. And we've seen that over and over, especially in music. Every change that comes, going all the way back, you know, there are critics, there are people who say this will ruin everything and eventually, you know, music grows, it reaches more fans, uh, it helps more music creators or, or artists uh, to, to re, you know, to, to make a living. The first step is very simple. We believe that to use a centric, you know, it's, it's time. It just, you know, it just requires people to, to come together as an industry in the interests of content creators and are in the interests of artists and give it a go. Uh, we are perfectly positioned to do this. And this I say without any hesitation, because we're, we're, you know, we're, we're a global company. We have a strong presence in a number of European countries and we can run a pilot in any of them, depending on what the rights holders want to do. So, uh, I mean, you know, this is maybe a shout out to everyone. We're ready whenever we're down to go. So let's do it. And then, you know, like fair to said, it's not the end. There's going to be something after this as well. But you have to start here. You have to start with the fundamental connection between the fan and the artist. If you don't have that, then, then you know, 
everything else becomes more theoretical. No, oh, many thanks, Anton. This is my final thank you to Anton. Thank you to Birte. Thank you to Nermina next to me here in the room. Thank you to our online audience and to the nice people here watching us here in the room, to the organizers of Waves and to the technical crew. You were just lovely. Many thanks. And we say hello and wave bye-bye. I hope you had an interesting time. <laughs>